I want to paint my bedroom, but I can't decide blue, green or yellow. I have a coin and I'm hoping it can help me choose. But how do you pick between three options with just a coin? If it were two options, it would be easy. Heads for blue and tails for green. Even any other power of two would be fine. Say, if I had eight colors, I could flip the coin three times and assign each outcome to a color. But three? That's where things get interesting. I asked a bunch of friends how they would solve it, and I got all kinds of answers. The most common one was to set up a mini tournament. Blue plays green and the winner faces yellow in the final. Whoever wins that game becomes the champion. It was easy, but there is a problem. It's not fair. Yellow only needs to win one game to take the title, while blue and green have to win two. Another popular idea was to compare the options pair by pair, and then pick the one that wins the most matchups. But what if they beat each other in a loop? What can we do then? Well, there is a clever trick to solve it. But before jumping to it, I want to build up to that, because the pass is actually more interesting. And even before that, I invite you to pause the video and try solving it yourself. Now, imagine we are not limited to a coin. Suppose we have a calculator that can generate a random number between 0 and 1. Then, the solution is simple. Divide the interval into three equal parts, assign each one to a color, then generate your random number and see where it lands. Also note, in most cases, you won't need many digits. Often, the first few determine the color. Well, there is a small chance that you will need to reveal more digits. We will come back to that soon. For now, our task is to imitate that calculator using nothing but our coin. And, as you might anticipate, we can do that by using the binary representation of numbers. You probably already know how to express a natural number as a sum of powers of 2. Well, in the same way, you can represent numbers between 0 and 1 as sums of negative powers of 2. That gives you a binary expansion for any such number. If you haven't seen this before, I encourage you to play around with it. Try writing down the binary expansion of a few sample fractions and see what happens. So, we can follow the same idea, just in a different representation. And why is it better? Because we can flip our coin over and over, getting zeros and ones from heads and tails, and gradually build a random number, bit by bit. Do we really need to keep flipping the coin forever to get an infinite binary string? In practice, no. In most cases, just a few flips are enough to already decide the final color. In a moment, we will calculate the expected number of the flips we actually need. But it's important to note, any strategy that gives a perfectly fair chance between three colors must allow the process to potentially go on forever in the worst case. The reason is simple. After k coin flips, you have 2 to the power of k possible outcomes, which is never divisible by 3. Let's compare this with the decimal version we talked about earlier. After the first digit, we split it into 10 bins. 8 of them correspond to a single color, but 2 still contains 2 possible colors. So, we need to keep going. And after 2 digits, we have 100 bins, and again, only 2 are problematic. The same things happen in the binary case. At every step, exactly 2 bins remain undecided. This motivates us to use an alternative way of writing the expected value. Starting from the standard formula, you can expand the terms vertically, then regroup them horizontally, and arrive at a neat new expression. Here is the idea. All you need is the probability of requiring at least one flip, at least two flip, at least three flips, and so on. That's much easier to calculate. 
The first term is one because we definitely need one flip. After the first flip, there will be two bins, both of which are problematic. So the next term is two over two. And the next term will be two over four because we will have four bins, but still two of them are problematic. And the next term is two over eight, the next one two over 16 and so on. And if you simplify that, it will sum up to three, as you might know. So on average, we only need three coin flips. Now, you might ask, can we do better? Can we come up with a smarter strategy that needs fewer than three coin flips on average? Actually, yes, we can. So how can we do that? Let's start by dividing the interval into four equal parts. Color the first quarter blue, the next one green, and the third one yellow. Now, the last quarter is still undecided, so we zoom in and repeat the same pattern within it. Divide it again into four equal parts, color the first blue, the second one green, and the third one yellow. And again, we continue this recursive process. If you have seen visual proofs for this type of constructions, you will recognize the key idea, symmetry. Each color is treated the same, just rotated in position. So in the end, each color occupies exactly one third of the total interval. Now let's calculate the expected number of coin flips in this setup. We use the same formula. The first term will be one again. And after the first coin flip, both spins are problematic. So the second term will be also one. But after the first two coin flips, the only problematic bin is the last one. So the third term will be one over four. But adding one more coin flip won't help us at all because then we will have two bins which are problematic out of eight, which gives us one over four again. But then after the first coin flip, we should be in the tiny bin at the end to be still undecided, which happens with the probability of one over 16. And after the next coin flip, we will get two over 32, which is essentially the same as one over 16. Going on with the same process, we reach to this series, which sums up to eight over three, which is less than three. So yes, we improved it, but it feels a bit magical. So how does this actually translate to the real world? Well, that recursive coloring process is just like repeating the same experiment again and again. Think of it this way. Suppose we temporarily add a fourth color, one that we know we don't like, say gray. Now we do a simple Coinbase tournament between these four options. Just flip the coin twice and pick the champion. If you get blue, green, or yellow, great. Decision made. But if you get gray, well, then you just betray the coin and repeat the experiment. So yes, we got a more efficient strategy, which is also easier to handle in practice. By the way, just for the sake of visualization, I flip three coins. But in reality, we only need two if we backpropagate. The point is, we don't need to flip in the semi-final whose winner end up losing in the final anyway. So we can start with the final coin flip and then only play out one of the semifinals. Before wrapping up, I will do what every mathematics teacher loves to do, leave you with a little homework. What if instead of three colors, we had five options to choose from? Both the strategies we explored can be extended. In the first method, you divide the interval into five equal regions. In the second method, you can artificially expand your list to eight options by adding three colors you don't like. But here is the question. Which approach is more efficient this time? Try calculating the expected number, just like we did earlier. A spoiler alert, the first approach wins this time. So here is your real challenge. Can you modify the second approach to beat the first one again, maybe you need a more clever coloring of the new artificial options. Will that be more efficient? I will leave the details and the fun of figuring it out to you. As for me, I think I will go with green, not because the coin said so, just because I like it more. Okay, thanks for watching and have fun calculating.